Why would he leave his own country to come here? Free cable. Hello, I'm Bill Gates. You're going to see the future. Before he became consigliere was Freddy Ayetzi. So we knew that he was with us. My uncle went way back with Santo Edone and Joe Scafidi, back to the Reds Caruso murder. So we knew that they were with us. And Frank Monti was very close with my uncle and Phil Testa. Remember, my uncle had Mickey Coco killed for selling drugs to Frank Monti's kid. So he was with us. We had everyone but Johnny Capello and Chicky Narducci. Yeah, they shit, Mario be some to the world. None of the captains were backing Harry Rico Bene. My uncle had the support of four out of the six captains, and he knew he had New York support. But you gotta remember, not all these guys played by the rules. That's why Ange and Phil tested no. dead. So we go to the wake, and everybody's there. The whole organization. Members, associates, you name it. Everyone connected to La Cosa Nostra was there. While we were there, Chicky Narducci comes up to my uncle and says, Nick. Pete Casella wants to see you after the wake to sort some things out. We want Fuck. you to come to John Capello's house. Now John Capello, who was a captain, is Pete Casella's brother-in-law. His house is the house where I got made. These guys knew my uncle was making moves with the other captains, Fuck. and my uncle was now almost certain that Pete Casella was in on the plot against Phil Testa with Chicky Narducci. So this is it. This is the other side wanting to sit down with my uncle. My uncle tells Chicky, I'll be there. Me and Chucky will come. Chicky says, good, we'll straighten things out. Now I'm standing there, and I'm hearing all of this, and I look at Chicky Narducci dead in his eye, and I say, I want Johnny Capella with me and Lawrence at the 9M bar as insurance. He leaves when my uncle and Chucky come back from the meeting. If anyone else but my uncle or Chucky walk through that door, John Capella will be dead before they get their guns out. Do you understand me? Now Chicky is taken aback, and he has this stunned look on his face. And my uncle has a half a smile on his face, like he's proud I spoke up and says, That's what it is. John Capella waits with my nephew until me and Chucky get back. Chicky kind of stammers a bit and says, Okay, Nick, we just want to talk. That's it. And my uncle says, Fine, we'll be there. When Chicky was walking away, I caught him giving me a look. I guess he felt that because he was a capo regime, I shouldn't have talked to him like that because I was just a soldier. And he was right. But if these guys weren't playing by the rules, why should I? I mean, Jesus Christ, they just whacked our boss out without approval from the commission. And he's going to give me the malocchio because he didn't like the way I spoke to him? My uncle sees what I'm seeing and he says, My whole <laughs> life, what have I told you about these ciggies? They are no fucking good. Greed and treason, that's all that's on their brain. Now my uncle moves right into action. He grabs Blackie Napoli, who is at the wake, and tells him to leave the wake and drive up to New York and set up a meeting with Bobby Manor for the next day. The day of the funeral, to discuss being named boss of the family. He told Blackie, after you see Bobby, you turn around and drive back to the 9M and tell me what he said. You also tell him about this meeting at John Capello's house. I want him to know everything. We're not going back to Atlantic City until you come back. I don't care what time it is. Blackie says, got it. And he's out the door. My uncle tells Chucky, get two guns, one for Philip and one for Lawrence. I want a couple of guys with them at the 9M in case there's any trouble. I want everyone in that bar ready to go. Meaning he wants everyone armed. Chucky says, okay, Nick. And he's out the door. My uncle looks at me and Lawrence and says, this is it. You guys know what to do if there's any trouble. And we both nod. We left the wake and went straight to the 9M. And when we got there, Chucky was there with a few of his guys. We walk in and Chucky hands me and Lawrence pistols and we sit at the bar, and we're waiting for Johnny Capello. About a half hour later, here he comes. And when he comes in, Chucky frisked him for weapons. As Chucky is checking him, he raises his hands, and looks at my uncle and says, Come on, Nick, is this necessary? And Chucky says, He's clean. My uncle says, It's just a precaution, John, that's all. And him and Chucky leave for the meeting. 
While we're sitting there, John Capella was trying to break the ice. He starts telling me and Lawrence the story about the Irish being behind Phil Testa's death. Me and Lawrence don't say nothing, and he's just talking, and I'm staring him dead in the eye as he's talking. I tell him, You know, if something happens to my uncle or Chucky, you won't leave this bar alive. You know that, right? And he looks at me and nods, and I say, Let's have some drinks and see what happens. And after that, I don't think he said two words the rest of the night. Now, like I did with Chicky Narducci, I shouldn't be talking to John Capello like that. But I'm thinking he's with the guys who killed Phil Testa. In my mind, I was thinking that those guys would have killed me, my uncle, Chucky, Lawrence, Salvi, all of us. So in reality, I didn't give a fuck about none of them. On this day, the day of Phil Testa's wake, that was the first time in my life that I ever balked at the rules of La Cosa Nostra. Motherfucker! So we're sitting there, and it seems like an eternity. A couple of guys were playing cards in one of the booths. A few more were watching TV. Two guys were sitting on stools by the front door. And we had two guys outside the bar. Everybody had a pistol on them. Me and Lawrence were sitting at the bar with John Capello, and he started drinking. He knows his night's gonna end one of two ways. Door number one, he's going home. Door number two, I'm putting two bullets in the back of his head. There ain't no door number three. Me and Lawrence were milking our drinks because we had to stay alert in case there was trouble. It was very, very tense. The waiting became very monotonous. And this John Capello just keeps drinking as the hours pass by. All of a sudden, around midnight, the two guys by the front door are off of their stools, and they are walking towards the door. The guys playing cards are on their feet. Lawrence starts walking towards the door. I got my gun in John Capello's ribs, and the door opens, and in walks my uncle with Chucky behind him. I take the gun and put it back in my pants, and my uncle walks right over to John Capello and says, Okay, John, you can go now. And this guy is out the door like Flash Gordon. Chucky tells the guys in his crew to stand outside, and that the only guy allowed in the bar is Blackie Napoli, who should be on his way back from New York with a message from Bobby Manna. Lawrence makes drinks for all of us, and we all toast, Salud, and my uncle tells us about the meeting. When we got there, it was Pete Casella, his brother Anthony, that backstabbing cocksucker Chicky Narducci, John Grand and his son, and this kid Rocco Maranucci. They checked us for weapons right when we got there. Rocco Maranucci was looking out one of the windows and listening to a police scanner, and the rug in the room where we were meeting was rolled up. I think they were planning on blasting us, but they knew that you guys would have killed John Capello. Chucky says, if you guys didn't have him here with guns on him, we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now. Lawrence chimed in and said, Motherfuckers. Now my uncle looks at me and says, You caught Chicky off guard by asking for Pete's brother-in-law as insurance. If they had said no, then there wouldn't have been no meeting. They weren't going to kill us and let him die as a result. So they tried plan B, which was to try and trick us. These fucking guys think I started doing this yesterday. These cocksuckers will show them. My uncle says, Pete Casella tells us that someone in New York told him that the Irish had killed Phil Testa and that he wanted me to retaliate. My uncle said Pete Casella was acting as if he was already the boss. My uncle says, I told him, Pete, that's not what I heard, and I have a meeting set up for tomorrow in New York with Bobby Manna to tell him what I think is going on. Chucky says, you should have seen their faces when Nicky said he had a meeting tomorrow with New York. The whole room got quiet, and that was the end of the meeting. So we're sitting there waiting on Blackie, and all of a sudden around 2 a.m., here he comes. My uncle greets him with a hug and a kiss on the cheek when he comes in and says, Well, how did it go? Blackie says, He wants you up there tomorrow for a sit-down. And my uncle tells him, Me and you are gonna go. We're gonna have to miss the funeral, but this can't wait. Blackie says, Okay, Nick. I'll see you tomorrow. And he leaves. This poor guy had driven two hours down for the wake, two hours up to New York to see Bobby Manor, two hours back to deliver the message, and now another two hours to get home. 
That's how it was in this life. This wasn't a nine to five job. Chucky and his guys walk me, my uncle and Lawrence to our car just in case the other side decides to take a shot. But they didn't, and we drove back down to Atlantic City. When we get home, it's like four in the morning. And my uncle says, go upstairs and wake up Dutch. Tell him I need a car around the corner first thing in the morning. Dutch, as I will call him, was a guy that lived in our building and ran errands for us. We let him stay there for free and gave him $200 a week. He did odd jobs for Scarf Inc. and Nat Nat, and he always helped out my mother or grandmother. He was a good guy, and we didn't involve him in anything illegal. So I go bang on his door and tell him what we needed, and he gets right up and gets a car and parks it a few blocks away on Florida Avenue, so my uncle can leave the back way through the alleys early the next morning without being detected. While guys like Chicky Narducci and Pete Casella were playing checkers, Mickey Scarfo and Philip Leonetti were playing chess. Each move was calculated and measured. And in March 1981, Little Nicky and Crazy oh, Phil were one step away from running the entire Philadelphia hey, Atlantic City mob. Scarfo had just turned 52. And in a matter of days, Leonetti would be 28. Scarfo's meeting scheduled the next day with his old pal from Yardville, Bobby Manna, was at this point Captain, merely it is 12 a formality. The new king is crowned. The morning of the funeral, me and Lawrence get up early and we're getting ready to go to Philadelphia. My uncle's up and he's getting ready to head up to New York for his meeting with Blackie Napoli and Bobby Manor. He's gonna go through the back alleys and get in the car Dutch had left for him, so he doesn't pick up a tail. You were always careful, but going to New York, you had to be extra careful. Guys like Bobby Manna and the Chin did everything top secret. So my uncle says, Tonight when I get back, we will meet up for dinner. When you guys are up there today, keep your antennas up. I want to know who's saying what and who's gathering with who. As Philip Leonetti and Lawrence Merlino were on their way to Philadelphia uh -huh. for Phil Fuck. Testa's funeral, yeah, Nicky Scarfo was on his way to North Jersey here. to meet with Blackie Napoli and Bobby Bannon in the back room of an Italian restaurant in Hoboken to discuss the future of the Bruno crime family, and more specifically, little Nicky's future as its boss. This game Ten like fucks prior, up, it doesn't let you progress to the fucking Napoli second stage, it just lets you replay the stage one, it's fucking State game. Prison and discussed their future plans as mob leaders. My uncle was very tight with those guys, ever since they were in Yardville together. Scarfo told Mana everything he had learned about Phil Testa's death. The beef with Chicky Narducci, the rumors about the Irish, and his less-than-friendly meeting with Pete Casella, the Mother of the way. Fucker. Scarfo told Mana that he believed Casella, Narducci, and others not yet known to him were behind Testa's murder. Mana told Scarfo that whoever had killed Phil Testa did not have the permission of the commission, and as such, the hit was unsanctioned. As it had done with the unsanctioned murder of Testa's predecessor, Angelo Bruno, the commission would launch an immediate investigation to identify those responsible and make arrangements to mete out the appropriate punishment. Death. Sitting at the head of the commission was Mana's boss and Scarfo's friend and ally, Vincent the Chin Gigante. Mana told Scarfo that he would schedule a meeting in a week, and that both Scarfo and Casella would present their case to the Genovese hierarchy, which consisted of Gigante, Mana, and Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the same individual who presided over the investigation of Angelo Bruno's murder one year prior, and who had ordered the gruesome torture killings of those involved. This time around, the Genovese would be without their Minister of Manipulation, Frank Fonzi Thierry, who was on his deathbed in a prison Fuck. hospital after being convicted of racketeering and sentenced to 10 years in prison. With Bullshit. or without Thierry, the deck was heavily stacked in Scarfo's favor, and little Nicky knew it. In one week, he would likely become the undisputed boss of the Philadelphia Atlantic City mob. That night, after his meeting with Blackie and Bobby Manor, me and my uncle went out to dinner at Caesars. I told him about the funeral, and he told me about the meeting. 
He said, "Fucking for the next motherfucker." Week, until I go to New York, we gotta watch our P's and Q's. God damn it! We're gonna stay close to home. His treachery. Why would he leave his own country to come here? Free cable. Hello, I'm Bill Gates. 